Alright, doing a biology video. I guess I'll just call it like biology 102 or something. Or 103. Yeah, 103, let's say. Anyway, this yeah, annoying guy, Hover Blover, Blover, uh, er, er. Um, anyway, post some annoying comments. First, he asked what the video was referenced, and he should have been following these videos. You know, they're all to Antikontavod mostly, and it's an Antikontavod video to comment on, and so, well, whatever. You should be able to find that yourself, buddy. But anyway, all right, regarding epigenetics at 24-ish, uh, you're wrong and right about this. Well, that's really a, a, a dangerous thing to start with, is you're wrong, without quoting me. That pisses me off. So fuck you for that. Um, the switching on and off of genes and the passing on of these states to the next generation can be of adaptive significance. Well, that's like a nothing statement. Duh. Examples include genes involved in resistance to insecticides, phenotype responses to soil quality, etc. Yeah, now you're talking about the more primitive life forms where epigenetics is a bigger part of their genetic code in the sense that they need to react to seasonal changes. Obviously, mosquitoes that lay eggs in the spring versus mosquitoes that lay eggs in the fall, they need a different kind of... Um, Prodigy would probably be in the best interest. Um, so yeah, you can find lots of examples where there's recessive qualities that are turned on and off depending on environmental circumstances, but it certainly has nothing to do with ourselves willing ourselves to have better code or doing something to improve our code. We can't improve it. We can just turn things on and off. And guess what? That's like turning. It's like saying you you got a feature like Wi-Fi on your computer. But the Wi-Fi stresses the CPU a little bit, so there's times where you want to turn the Wi-Fi off. So all you're doing is turning off the improvements, in a way. And this all does relate to recessive and dominant genes, which exist for a reason, which is sometimes positive changes, you know, changes that work for this year or next year and the year after that, might not be in the long-term interest of your survival. So it's in the genetic code's interest to have mechanisms that protect against going down wrong roads, dead ends. It doesn't want to go down a dead end. Even though it's an improvement in the short run, it doesn't want to hit the dead end of long-term failure. So it wants to have some capacity to keep throwing the throwbacks in. So it's a throwback mechanism. And that's what they found with epigenetics in human beings, is that when I said you can only create errors, you know, I probably could have said that better and said that, yeah, what you can do is end up having a gorilla as a child, okay? You can end up throwbacking. Because what they find is is that the more stressed the woman is, um, especially during pregnancy, the more likely your kid's going to be born with a tail. The more likely recessive genes will be turned on because basically the mechanism is saying, go back to the old thing because this new one might not be working. Kind of. In a, in a subtle way. And how exactly DNA does that, I think, is just through error checking. So the same mechanism a computer has, like a, when your computer's doing this stuff, it's doing it with a bunch of error checking. All right, so when it writes stuff, you know, when it's doing stuff in the, in the memory locations and everything, it puts the stuff in two different places. And then it checks the two things, and it says, are those two things the same? And that's the way it knows that the, you know, it, there isn't a write failure somewhere, or a read failure, because the memory is a little bit funky, and sometimes it screws up. And so if it finds that the two things don't match, it has to choose, you know, uh, uh, what it, what it, how, how, how to it, you know, is going to deal with that circumstance. And the, the way it might deal with it is it might go back to some other piece that it has also stored, um, or it might be a two, it might have it in three places and just go two against one. Um, so the same kind of error checking exists in our genetic code, and so when in doubt, it just goes, says, go back to the, go back, go back, <laughs> you know, go back a step, and uh, that's going to be a likely response of the code, anyway. So, <clears throat> all right, well, he's going to do this thing, so I might as well get there. All right, um, Lex Lamarck was not entirely wrong. Well, see, that's just a bullshit statement. He was entirely wrong, okay? There's no way to will yourself a longer neck or a bigger penis. It just ain't going to fucking goddamn happen. You're not going to be able to will your kid a bigger penis. 
It just ain't gonna happen. As much as you hope and wish and all that crap, it ain't gonna fucking happen. So Lamarck was completely full of shit. And it's just stupid to say he was not entirely wrong. He was entirely wrong. <laughs> anyway, uh, in a sense, we already knew this. No, we don't know this. This is a bull another bullshit sentence. After all, liver cells beget liver cells. No biggie. I love that kind of terminology. Anyway, but you are dead right that this is not seen as any challenge to the Darwinian mechanism. Well, of course it isn't. That's right. So I'm not wrong, you fucker. Um, in the big picture. Well, anyway, let's just get to the selfish gene shit. This is where he goes way the fuck off course. Um, conference report is quite right that the interests are not necessarily the same at different levels. Well, no, look, they're not different levels. All right, if if a fucking queen ant creates a bunch of slaves, obviously the the non-reproducing slaves are not part of the genetic code. All right, so they obviously have nothing to do with any of this shit, right? They don't have anything to do with anything epigenetic, and they certainly don't have anything to do with the selfish gene anymore. They're just disposable slaves. They are not part of the genetic... If, if they, they could have all kinds of mutations, they could be doing all kinds of interesting evolution, and it's going to be completely irrelevant because they are irrelevant to the genetic code. Period. 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 They're slaves. That's all they are. Okay, so... Uh, and that so that works for insects because they have so many they can produce a new copy so easily that they can afford to create slaves so it seems a perfectly reasonable mechanism you know if you can create millions of offspring then you might as well create the millions of offspring to be, create a shield around you uh, so you don't get killed and that's all that's happening the queen is just creating slaves to create a shield around her and she's the animal that's actually evolving they are not evolving at all she's evolving um, so there's nothing there's no level here okay these the slave organisms are not they shouldn't even be called ants okay because they're not really ants they're slaves and drone bees are slaves all right that's all they are they're slaves to the the, the queen's DNA period they're not in the game. They're, they're fucking sperm cells with swords. They're, they're, they're not playing the evolutionary game. Anyway, <clears throat> the selfish gene, the book that is, <clears throat> is in fact one long argument explaining this, mainly to sociobiologists who at the time were advocating group selection to explain certain adaptations. Well, group selection is in effect in the sense that when you get to the higher mammals, obviously mammals can't create an army of slaves. So instead, it goes with a mechanism of hierarchy. So there's one individual that's given the, the adaptations are turned on, the improvements. So one individual gets the Wi-Fi, gets the um, whatever, the infrared scanner, gets the blah blah camera, gets all the, gets all the new features, and all the others are left with the old features. They're just left to be kind of sacrificial. All right, to the alpha. And that's sort of where the investment is. So their investment is in the survival of their, of their society in the sense that the structure survives. The structure of having a group survives. And they become incidental in the sense that they don't have any genetic um, stake in the game and they're basically just slaves again they're just they're they're it's just like having one kid that's going to be the main kid let's say you have six kids one kid's going to be the main kid and the other five kids are essentially going to create a shield for that one kid that that's going to become that's going to you know have the recessive dream i mean it's going to have the the dominant you know the yeah, it's going to have the dominant the improved genes turned on instead of the unimproved. Um, this is one way you're looking at. Um, for instance, self-sacrifice for the colony is not in the welfare interest of the worker ant, but is certainly if mom behaves herself in the interest of her genes. Well, again, her genes are the only genes in the game. There are no worker ant genes. The worker ants carry the mother's genes, and it's, that's all there is. There is no other genetic code taking place. 
Um, period. Period. Um, uh, but we're not ants, and there's a similar mechanism created in mammals that, uh, you know, we're a hierarchy, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the dominant alpha syndrome, um, do, attempts to duplicate the mechanism, but obviously it can't do it to the same grotesque extent, but it's still doing this idea of investing in a narrow set of generic, uh, genetic code and having disposables. Um, and I would argue that that probably does slow down evolution. And you can sort of, uh, you might get an indication of that in the sense that many organisms that have dramatic alpha effects, physical effects related to their alpha morphing, like uh, orangutans and elephant seals and some other organisms, even I think polar bears do some of this, um, that they're animals that are, didn't exactly take over the world. You know, they're not exactly spread everywhere, where animals like, I don't know if there's much in wildebeest or buffalo, I don't know if they have much of an alpha manifestation. Um, so, um, you know, are seem more successful in the sense that they're going to be more durable because they're more widespread. So it does seem like there might be some, it, it, it might suppress your evolution, it might slow it down if you resort to this feature because you're essentially saying we're going to cut off you know five out of uh, out of six of um, the genetic variation we're going to kind of cut off from the breeding pool and so it probably does slow down evolution but most evolution I'm going to argue isn't taking place in those big um, colonies it's taking place in isolated um, um, go west young men type colonies. The inbreds are the ones that create the evolution. Um, Galapagos Island is a perfect example. Um, so, uh, yeah, so anyway, I'm just, this, I just find this statement wrong and I find this statement irritating um, where you say uh, is quite right because that's really dangerous because in his statement he talked about angels and monsters and that there's some sort of uh, similar probability of creating an angel versus a monster and there's nothing angel okay even worker ants even though they appear to be oh how nice of them it's monstrous they're enslaved okay I mean the drone bee is a slave all right it takes care of the young and then as and when and when it gets old when it's beat up from working so hard then they throw it out there to go sting somebody and die I mean, they're completely disposed, completely abused. If that's your definition of an angel, something that's been programmed to be a slave, that's a pretty disgusting example of angelism, right? And I would argue that calling something else an angel, now, there's just no way to create angels here. That's not what's happening. All right? What's happening is you're creating, you know, slaves to hierarchy. And, and, you know, to, to, that, that's just a very, uh, and that's monstrous in itself, is it not? So how, how could angelism be the, what, the bastard child of monsterism? I mean, it just isn't, you can't call that an angel. I mean, if, it, if, it's, if, if Frankenstein gave birth to it, it's not a fucking angel. Um, it, it has a monstrous purpose. It exists for a monstrous reason. And even though it looks like something, I'm obviously it's not living a good life, because it's basically been called fodder. It's been basically being turned into a mechanism to be used, to be exploited, uh, for the benefit of of an individual's genetic code, which represents the colony's genetic code. So there is no group selection explicitly, in the, other than the sense that the group code becomes the alpha code. So anyway, so fuck you though for this, you are wrong, and fuck you for indicating that conference report was right in what he said. What he said was absolute motherfucking crap. There's no equal probability, and there's not even an evidence of planet Earth giving birth to a fucking angel, ever. Show me one. That's what the selfish gene points out, that even symbiotic relationships are just parasitic relationships where the parasiticism has become in the long-term interest of both parties. 
So it's exploitation and parasitism. These are not angel characteristics. These are monster characteristics. So fuck you. I hate your comment. It's obnoxious and I really shouldn't... I mean, you know, what am I supposed to do with this crap? Was I supposed to explain all this in a comment section, you fuckhead? So I, I just think, again, if you're, and if anybody, for the, just for future reference, if you're going to say I'm wrong, then I want a fucking quote. So I'm just telling people for, I'm not going to block this guy, but look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to react really negative to fuckers saying I'm wrong without quoting me. And you better make sure you quote me accurately, and you better make sure it's in context, because I'm not going to accept some sort of perversion of my quote either. I'm clear about what I say most of the 99.9% .9 of the time. And anybody with a little bit of brains, you know, just a little bit of fairness, is going to get the drift. I'm just, just giving you a fair warning. It pisses me the fuck off. Is it, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to explain all this in a comment section for you personally? Shit. That's a silly expectation.